Welcome to the Ahead of the Curve series at MyMostLife.com, where we feature people making a difference in their world and inspiring others. Enjoy. Welcome to Most Life's Ahead of the Curve series. Today, we are featuring Fawn Lopez, publisher of Modern Healthcare. Fawn and I got to know each other a couple of months ago at a Women Leaders in Healthcare conference that her organization was conducting in Nashville, Tennessee, and Fawn uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, this technology isn't always easy. We went through a couple of struggles to get here, and so glad to see you uh, there in your in your offices in Chicago. Um, Fawn has been a leader in healthcare publishing for years. Started out her life uh, in Vietnam, and she's going to tell us a little bit about her childhood and family story about coming to the United States. Grew up in Lee Summit, Missouri, and went to school at University of Missouri first as an engineering student and decided to pursue business and took on the career of publishing for most of her career. And Fawn, we're so glad that you are at the helm of Modern Healthcare. It's certainly more than what it probably was when you started. As most uh, magazines or newspapers these days, they are multi-dimensional media conglomerates. And I know just knowing about Modern Healthcare, uh, you're at the helm of, of quite a big communication company. I guess that's what we call them now, they're communication companies. Vaughn, welcome to Ahead of the Curve series for our healthcare month. We appreciate you spending time here. And tell us a little bit about your childhood and what formed you in, in your um, aspirations, confidence, and courage that you have. Maureen, thank you so much for having me. It's, uh, I feel very honored to be asked to uh, kick off the series. And um, again, it's a uh, it's a complete um, honor and a pleasure to be uh, to be with you. So, how did I get started, or what um, uh, um, gave me the uh, foundation mm -hmm. uh, for who I am today? Well, I, as you said uh, earlier, I uh, grew up in Vietnam and actually lived there during the war um, until I was 15 years old. And it was um, towards the end of the war, um, our family left Vietnam uh, essentially a week before um, Saigon fell. And um, I was 15 years old, and we came to America. Uh, and luckily for us, most families, Vietnamese families in our situation, uh, were not as uh, fortunate enough to, uh, to have left Vietnam with their families. So mm. uh, we came to America as refugees of the Vietnam War. Um, like I said, essentially a, a week before Saigon fell. Uh, we had to leave because my father was a colonel in the South Vietnamese Army. And um, there was no uh, real option. Uh, we would have probably been uh, killed uh, had we stayed. Mm. So uh, we left with no money, um, a couple of pounds of belonging uh, each of us was allowed uh, to leave Vietnam with, and um, stayed, settled in uh, a couple of camps um, prior to uh, starting our new life in uh, America. Mm -hmm. We stayed in uh, Camp Pendleton for essentially three months uh, and then left the camp. We were sponsored out of the camp uh, to Kansas City, Missouri. Why Kansas City, Missouri? My father was a colonel in the South Vietnamese, as I said, and he spent a lot of time in, in America learning and teaching um, American uh, military uh, officers how to fight guerrilla warfare. And uh, one of the schools that he was at was um, Fort Leavenworth, and it was it's not too far from Kansas City, and he decided that he wanted to settle um, there because there are six kids, and uh, he wanted us to focus on our future, and he knew that um, by settling in um, a place where there's less Vietnamese, um, that we would be more focused on our education, on our future, more importantly, uh, assimilate and integrate into our new life in um, America and becoming Americans and not uh, just uh, living as uh, Vietnamese in somebody else's land. Right. So um, 
So we settled in, in Kansas City, Missouri, and that was where it, um, uh, we moved to. And then two months after we had arrived to Kansas City, my father decided that it was way too big. Uh, he <laughs> wanted his family to, his kids to focus on obviously school. So he moved us to Lee Summit, Missouri, which uh, at the time was one of the smallest towns in Kansas City. Um, at the time, there, was, there were probably 30,000 people there. We were probably, we were the first Vietnamese family settled in Lee Summit. That was where we got our start. And English and, was not your primary language when you came to the U.S.? No, I uh, learned English uh, after uh, we started school. Um, I started my freshman year in high school um, in September of 1975, and it took me about a year or so to uh, learn the language, to be able to communicate. Uh, so I carried a, a Vietnamese English dictionary with me uh, almost everywhere I went, and I, I learned a trick to learn because I knew French, wow. to uh, attend French classes, to learn English uh, <laughs> through the French classes that I that I took, well, and that took about a year or so before we could uh, I could actually communicate and carry on a conversation. You're obviously a much smarter person than I am because there's no way that I could imagine myself at the age of 15 uh, learning a a new language in a foreign country, having just uh, been moved by my entire family toward from a country that was your homeland that had basically fallen. Um, yes, I think uh, those of us who are old enough old enough to remember uh, the turmoil that we felt here in the U.S. for for the Vietnam War. Um, we don't need to obviously do a history lesson here, but what a what a tremendous transition you had to make in a foreign land. Obviously, your parents are very strong minded, and they obviously guided you well. And that to me sounds like maybe one of your first mentoring uh, feelings was maybe how your parents kind of pushed you toward something that was not that comfortable, probably not that easy, and supported you along the way. And, and here you go, graduating from college five, six years after that. I mean, that's, I can't even imagine what that was like. Yes, it is. It, you know, my uh, father, uh, my mentor all my life. He was a great role model. My, my parents uh, were great role models. Um, I was, uh, I'm one of five girls and my parents um, only wanted two kids and they kept trying because they wanted a son and they kept going through girl one girl <laughs> after another and then it took five tries before they had their, uh, my, my brother. My, uh, their son, so they stopped there. So I'm from a family of six, five girls, and so I grew up um, with my dad telling us that um, you can do anything you want to do. It doesn't matter if you're a girl, uh, if you want to be an engineer, if you want to be a president, you can if you really want to put your mind to it. So that started way when uh, uh, before I was really uh, consciously aware of, right. of my uh, talent, my skills, and uh, capabilities. Uh, so I have my father always told us, instilled in us that uh, whatever you want it to, to be, you can if you want if you put your mind to it. And so. After we uh, arrived in Vietnam, and that, that's very unusual for a Vietnamese. I was going to say, it doesn't sound like the culture of the no. Vietnamese or that right. area. Right. Mm -hmm. But my father was all, you know, he, he had a, a career uh, picked for each of us girls. <laughs> uh, so I was the engineer. Okay. And uh, so because I was good in math and science, and I was um, I'm very analytical, and he decided that when I was like five or six, that I was going to be um, the engineer uh, of the family. So when we came here, um, he was a huge role model in that he essentially, you know, he came from a family, uh, a very wealthy family, and he was in very high, um, he was a high-ranking officer in the military. But overnight, um, 
after we arrived, we had nothing but ourselves uh, and uh, an opportunity to build a, a better future. Mm -hmm. And that was that was what he did. Uh, he essentially just never looked back. He took some of the most menial jobs, worked two jobs um, for years to um, help put uh, food on the table. My mother never worked before in my life until we came here. She was born into a very wealthy family. Uh, I grew up very privileged. And overnight, things changed, um, but they never looked back. My mother mm -hmm. took her first job ever at the age of 49 as yes. a seamstress and worked until she was in her mid-60s and has a carpal tunnel to mm -hmm. show for it. Oh. Uh, so they both have been great inspiration for me, a uh, great role model. So you started your you started your college uh studies in engineering as per your father's plan it sounds like and then right. uh finished up with with business decided to get into publishing and you hit some obstacles but found some friends along the way to get you um into the career you you had your heart set on and that was again to me another part of your journey where you were able to find mentors and people who who brought you along um, certainly you had a lot of skills for sure but having mentors along the way. Tell us a little bit about how you emerged into the publishing industry with the use of some mentors you found along the way. Sure. Just a very quick story about my changing my uh, uh, education from engineering into business. Um, my father was a very, uh, very decisive, very uh, strong uh, person. So when he decided that I was going to be an engineer, I was going to do that, but I realized after two years into it that I didn't like what I was doing, and um, but I didn't want to disappoint him. Um, so I went to my mother and told her uh, that I didn't like what I was, and I was I'm going to change my major, and that was up to her to tell my dad uh, because I didn't have the courage. But I had the cur I, I knew what I wanted to do. Uh -huh. I did. At the time, I knew what I didn't want to do. I didn't want to be an engineer. So I decided that I was going to change. So actually, my mother never bothered to tell my father until <laughs> the day he went to my graduation. <laughs> and he was reading through the graduation booklet, and he couldn't find my name in the engineering school, from the engineering school. And he asked my mom, he said, well, is she graduating or not? My mom said, well, she is, but in a from a different school. And you know, my dad, like, we never talked about that for several years after my graduation. And um, I became, I got into publishing and worked my way up. I, I, it was a struggle in the beginning, and it took a couple of years, and I, I'll talk a little bit about that in a few, a few minutes. It took a few years, and um, I started in sales, and I, I was at the lowest of the totem pole. Uh, and then within a year and a half, I became the top, the nationally ranked number one salesperson in the company. And my company ran an ad um, congratulating me for having achieved that status mm -hmm. that year. And my father subscribed to the publication. And I knew when he approved was when I came home and that ad was posted <laughs> proudly on his bulletin board <laughs> and it was we didn't even talk about that until several years later and he told me that he wanted me to know that more than anything he was really proud of me for having followed my heart that that I wasn't you know uh, I had the courage right to to go against his wishes but I didn't do it in a way that would hurt his feelings so mm -hmm. I proved it to him that um I was, you know, I could be, uh, uh, that I was strong enough and uh, smart enough to follow my heart and, and right. do what I really love to do. And, and oh. as a result, became successful. Yeah, that's, So, yeah, that's I met a, a lot of people along the way. Right. Uh, I didn't have any sales background. I didn't have any advertising background. And my very first professional mentor was a publisher of, 
the business journal, the Kansas City Business Journal that I applied at. And it took several tries before I was allowed to meet with them. And when I met with him, um, one of the first questions that he asked me was, um, so, you know, sales is a very tough job and you uh, get a lot of rejection. So how do you deal with rejections? How would you think, how would you deal with that? And, you know, I never had any sales training, didn't know how to overcome objections. Uh, but naturally, I just said to him, I, you don't know me. Uh, mm -hmm. My life story is pretty long to tell, but let me just, you know, um, make it real quick uh, to give you a pick, uh, for some perspective as to uh, who I am and, and what I do and what I'm capable of. And I told him, I said, you know, I came from Vietnam um, at the time uh, that was in 1982 uh, that I, uh, 84, that I, I applied at the, at the business journal. So nine years later, uh, I came seven, nine years ago uh, without knowing a word of English. I skipped my junior year because I didn't want to, I wanted to go to college. Uh, I have had to deal with a lot of challenges and I said, um, and I became one of the top uh, sales managers at the limited. So nine years with all of that that happened to me uh, mm -hmm. that I have had to overcome. I don't think someone uh, saying no to me <laughs> would really hurt my feelings that much. <laughs> and I said, uh, so I don't see this as a challenge. I see it as a huge uh, opportunity for me or a huge motivation for me to continue to uh, to do better, to, to, to be more uh, uh, courageous and successful. And he took one look at me, he smiled and he said, well, you don't have to tell, say too much because you're hired. <laughs> and he became a real, um, uh, very, we, we, we developed a very good relationship, a very trusting relationship where he really was an amazing supporter, mentor. He, uh, he helped me uh, look at things differently. He helped me to navigate uh, some of the, you know, uh, rougher uh, spots in the business world that I hadn't anticipated. So um, lots of um, pat on the back, lots mm -hmm. of, you know, uh, 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 confidence building, Lot, tons of support right. and very sincere. And uh, so he was one of my very first mentors. And along the way, uh, I met many, uh, and all many of them uh, have contributed to the success, success, my success today and uh, over the last 30 years. So when you, um, when you and I met, uh, we were at a Modern Healthcare Women's Leaders Conference and in just talking with you and then it, you shared with me a, um, a talk you had given, there's a lot of women leaders who I think you have basically connected with and, and you do a great job of sharing their story and some of their secrets to success. Um, certainly both men and women lead men and women mentors. Um, I think there's a lot of positives in each of the, I'll just say kind of gender types typically a man would offer certain skills, a, a woman another, just kind of typically, obviously there's plenty who cross uh, more of a full spectrum, but there's a couple of women um, mentors in healthcare, I think um, you've kind of surrounded yourself with and, and kind of showcase as, as leaders. But what, what, what drew you into the healthcare world and what, what's kind of propelled you to be so successful um, in the healthcare world? Because it is a different niche in the healthcare industry versus business journal or sales. So tell us a little bit about your journey into the healthcare world. Sure. My journey into healthcare um, is different than uh, why I'm still in healthcare. So I was uh, asked to come to modern healthcare by the former publisher, my predecessor, the uh, longtime publisher of modern healthcare, Chuck Lauer. 
um, in 2001. Um, for a year or so before that, he, I was at uh, a sister publication. And for a year or so, he kept coming to me, asking me to consider going to um, switching uh, titles, going from one publication that Crane Chicago Business to Modern Healthcare, because he was at the time looking for someone to help run the operation. And the magazine was uh, in a at the at the uh, at one of the toughest phase, phases in its um, life cycle, and was dealing with a lot of change and dealing with a lot of competition, and so uh, he needed someone to help him uh, turn uh, the magazine around. And I kept saying no because I was having such a great um, ride. An incredible success at Craig Chicago Business. We had just gone through a, a year when every record was broken. So um, I kept saying no to Chuck. And then finally, I was asked to do it for the company. And that was my reason for entering healthcare. I didn't really know anything about healthcare. I didn't know, you know, I knew that health, modern healthcare was a um, very important title in the industry, highly respected, but I really didn't have any concept of the field, what, what it was all about. And um, I knew I, I wanted to stay within six months after I had arrived at Modern Healthcare. It was a hard, hard uh, time when I had to implement a ton of change, a lot of changes that had to happen. And it was a very, um, very hard, difficult time learning the industry uh, and trying to make changes and improving on the operation of the magazine. But what I realized very quickly was that um, people in healthcare were such incredibly mission driven, ethical, uh, smart people. Uh, and that's, I'm, I'm always inspired by that. Uh, I, I, I thrive. Uh, I love being around people that are mission driven, people who are smart, who, who care a lot, and who are really nice people. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of people that I came across in my six months uh, at Modern Healthcare. So I knew I didn't want to leave uh, after that. Uh, so I, that was my decision. I decided to stay. And it, you know, healthcare is still very male dominated, mm -hmm. and it, even more than. Uh, at the time that I entered healthcare. And uh, Chuck, my predecessor, was in his role for 25 plus years at the time. So he was highly regarded. And um, here I came with, you know, no experience, no um, understanding, no knowledge of healthcare. And, uh, but people were very, very welcoming. They were so willing to help. Um, and I met lots of great mentors along the way. Uh, men, women, uh, you know, Tom Dolan, the, the former or retired CEO of the ACHE. Uh, Which is Wayne the American Smith. College of Healthcare Executives, just for folks who might not. Yes, be, uh, it's a with, highly uh, respected uh, leadership uh, or executive uh, type association in healthcare. And Wayne Smith, the chairman CEO of um, Community Health Systems. Um, and then I met other women who would play a big role in my uh, success in healthcare, in my growth and development. Uh, one of my dearest friends in healthcare is Terry Fontenot, the CEO of uh, Women's Hospital in Baton Rouge. Um, incredibly. Uh, smart, really nice, and very, very willing to share. Uh, and, and that's what I find uh, about people in healthcare. People are, um, they take great pride in helping, in, in, right. for the most part, most of them that I met anyway, in helping uh, others uh, and, and uh, uh, to succeed. And right. uh, Terry Fontenot is another one. My boss, um, who is uh, one of the top executives in 
head of our company, uh, Gloria Scoby, is a uh, is a huge mentor to me, who's you know been instrumental in my uh, success both at Modern Healthcare and um, personally. Uh, so yes, many people have played a a, a, a role in in my success and. Mm -hmm. uh, I know who to go to uh, for uh, whatever uh, help that I need. And uh, you, Tom um, will help me to navigate uh, the, you know, certain minefields. Uh, he will, if I don't know, if I didn't know uh, someone at a company that I needed to uh, reach out to, he will, he would reach out and and help me. Uh, figure out how to to make that work. Uh, Wayne Smith did the same way. I did the same thing. Uh, Terry Fontenot as well. And when I didn't know uh, an issue uh, or what you know uh, certain issues, how it would how they would impact the industry, I knew who to uh, to contact for uh, further explanations to. Right. Uh, what I needed to know. Fawn, uh, a lot of uh, successful, um, confident, courageous people might uh, not feel comfortable relying on other people. Um, so, where does where does that kind of mix with you being successful and confident yourself? Um, tell me a little bit about what the insight is on finding help with other people, but still feeling confident in yourself. You know. Um I I was brought up um, the knowing, uh, being told, or having been taught that you don't know everything, and uh, and it's better to ask than to pretend. Mm -hmm. So uh, I I don't like to pretend uh, uh, mm -hmm. that I know something when I don't know it. Mm -hmm. um, so I think courage comes with that. It's it's uh, it's having the ability to say, you know, I need help. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know this. Um, I can be, I'm, I'm, I'm a risk taker. I'm a very courageous person. Um, but I'm not too uh, proud or too insecure to say, I don't know something. And if there's somebody else that can help me understand better uh, so that I can be more effective, then definitely I will... Um, Reach out to that person right. and let them know. I, 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 I don't I don't think that's a weakness. I think I yeah. see that as a a strength. Right. Uh, I love it when my staff uh, would come to me and say, "I don't know something. Would you help me understand this?" Right. Uh, it, it's it's better that they know. Right. And to and walk that, around right. pretending. <laughs> and that really um, I think helps uh, with one of the statements you made in in the talk that you gave that you shared with me, uh, one of your mentors, Dr. Riza Levizo mori Yes. Um, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Go together. Someone, Correct. Uh, actually, that's her quote. Uh, yeah. and, and I I admire her. Uh, I don't, actually, she uh, wasn't a mentor, uh, but I always admire her mm -hmm. uh, and the work that she's done. She's one of our top 25 women uh, in healthcare, um, and we recognize top women in healthcare. Uh, the last ten years, every other year, we will um, list. We will uh, recognize twenty-five top women mm -hmm. that we, Modern Healthcare, uh, have identified. Right. And so she's she's one of those women that I um, I I think great. I, I think highly of. And uh, that's the quote is uh, um, is that. You're, we're better together, yes. uh, cumulatively. Uh, in my opinion, uh, we're smarter uh, as a group than we are by ourselves. Right. And the other, um, you have a couple of tips uh, throughout this talk. I just want to focus on on one of them as we kind of uh, pull into the meaning week, which is the week that that this interview will be featured. The focus on uh, the leadership of be rather than the do. Right. And uh, I think especially people who are aspiring to be more successful most likely come out of the ranks as doers 
And then when the leadership shift has to happen for them to be a leader versus a doer, some people can't necessarily navigate uh, that. I'm sure you came across that in your career as you moved uh, in higher levels of responsibility from actually doing work and being someone who was tasked with getting stuff done to relying on others and being a leader. Can you elaborate yeah. a little bit on that? Yeah, you, you know, I think, I think for women, we, uh, we tend to uh, uh, focus on getting things done. Right. Um, so we, 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 we try really hard. Uh, we're, we're very task oriented. Just get it done. But I think for as a leader, you need to, to get used to being uh, rather than just doing. Um, and that's that, that takes some getting used to right. and that takes some uh, real focused effort. But um, and you still have to do. But but being. Be, be more conscious uh, about being there, being being the leader that you need to be, rather than just um, making sure that you know just getting things done right. uh, is is very important uh, for anyone in leadership uh, roles. Right. Now I know also um, again just in in how we met and our conversation we had when we uh, were first introduced in August. You also have a, a very well-rounded life from my perspective. Uh, we saw each other first in the uh, fitness center at the hotel. I didn't know who you were at the time until the next, until later that morning. Um, yes. And then you kind of talk also about making a commitment to exercise and your health. Can you tell me and kind of express a little bit about your idea of living a most life and, and kind of making sure you take care of uh, all the aspects of, right. of living well for you? So I I believe that if you don't, take care of yourself first. You can't take care of anybody else. So, um, and our job, you know, um, hard. And to do what we need to do effectively and successfully, and to lead as effectively and successfully, uh, we need to be healthy, uh, both spiritually, uh, physically, uh, mentally. And um, and that's really hard to do when you're so busy, when you are so focused on, you know, um, achieving the task at hand. But at the end of the day, um, I I was at uh, I was in an accident uh, four plus years ago, mm. and it never really was uh, hit home uh, as much as it when really as I was laying there, uh, or as I was going through my rehabilitation mm. is that if you are not healthy uh, physically, mentally, spiritually, you, you, there's nothing that you can be, I mean, you can't be that, that effective. Mm -hmm. And so I try really hard um, to carve out time to focus on the me. Uh, am I feeling good today? Am mm -hmm. I feeling positive today? And I think you know, in my in my opinion, feeling positive, spiritually, mentally, has everything to do with physical, the physical well-being. Yes. So I spend time um, working out. I work out a lot. Um, I um, if I don't, I, I feel lethargic. I don't I'm, I don't make decisions as um, uh, effectively, uh, decisively. Mm -hmm. um, I make bad decisions mm -hmm. when I'm tired, mm -hmm. and I find. Uh, that I get more energy when I'm uh, physically uh, healthy, and so um, so I spend I spend I don't forget I don't let um, that take the back seat. Mm -hmm. uh, it's part of you know the, uh, it, my priorities. Um, every day I have priorities at work, and then I have my personal priorities. And one of that is um, one of my priorities is to focus on exercising and um, spending time for myself, mm -hmm. getting my mind right before I go to work, right. getting my mind right at the end of the day uh, so I can go home and be a good uh, uh, may, um, a partner to my, to my husband. Mm -hmm. uh, so I can focus on him as opposed to uh, worrying about work. Right. Right. No, I hear you. And that's, you know, that's, a, I think, a, a resonating factor with a lot of folks who 
who have achieved a level of success, um, you can't go there with the, without the body. And it's not easy to yeah, do. I mean, yes. you can that can take the back a backseat really fast, right. and you just can't allow that to happen. Right. Right. Other than other than what you've already shared with us about mentoring and basically finding meaning through kind of uh, supporting others and and allowing them to to be who they are and supporting people's growth. Uh, what other tips might you have for our most life audience on, on living a most life and, and basically finding the, the greatest level of meaning um, in what you do? You no, know, um, I, I think uh, for me, I, uh, I gain uh, a lot of, uh, I gain more from, uh, being grateful. So to me, the, there are four things I, I try to live by, and it's authenticity, um, honesty, integrity, uh, sincerity, maybe five, <laughs> and, and, and and then have their keys to successful um, every area of your life. And, um, but you can't really, uh, Enjoy it as much if you're if if there's if you don't show gratitude. Uh, I think uh, gratitude is the major part of feeling getting a, a, a getting meaning from life. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm always grateful um, for everything. Uh, it, it's not it's not that I you know um, think that that. Uh, Everyone's responsible for my success, but I am always grateful for their role in my success. And or just I'm grateful for waking up feeling good. Yes. Uh, because for months I I woke up not feeling good. So um, so just you know I'm grateful for having a beautiful, nice sunny day in Chicago mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. uh, and we forget that. Yes. And I think once you um, are focused and conscious about that, you see more meaning in life. You're happier at the result. That's my personal opinion. Well, thank you very much for sharing that. Uh, you and I have that in common. Um, I, I believe truly, as you just expressed, that if you can focus on being grateful, even for the small things, or maybe especially for the small things, um, right. like a nice day, like waking up and just the fact that you are waking up and you have a place to go and, uh, right. things to do and people to interact with, uh, that the, a grateful heart is a, is, is open to receiving, um, all kinds of blessings. And, um, I will say that I am grateful today that we were able to connect, um, and, uh, and, and share this time together. Your story for me personally, is really inspiring. Um, coming from a, a foreign, war-torn land to be such a success in America and being a beacon for others and to showcase others. And your job as the publisher of Modern Healthcare, you get to showcase a lot of the best and what's really working in healthcare. And to me, that's that, that's got to be gratifying. As you know, I started my career as a registered nurse and spent... Uh, all of my career up until just recently in the healthcare field, um, trying to have an influence of moving healthcare in the right direction. You are a beacon to let others see who else is doing it right and to share best practices and to celebrate those folks who have worked so hard to make some healthcare institutions in this great country of ours um, really excellent. And uh, I mean, we're gonna continue to stay connected and, and follow each other uh, because I, I really love what modern healthcare has done for healthcare, and it really has created a nice forum for, for sharing excellence and for sharing great leadership principles. And certainly, if you didn't have that within yourself, you wouldn't be able to uh, lead the, the modern healthcare um, era today in, in doing all that. So I'm grateful. You know, Ma you know Maureen, it's, it's not that difficult to do uh, <laughs> in my role because I get to learn every day, and I'm inspired every day because of the work that nurses, physicians, uh, that the people that are, that are in healthcare are doing to make yes. this healthcare um, um, industry a, a better place for patients, for employees. Um, so I, I'm grateful for that 
for our little role in the process mm -hmm. to be able to um, help uh, leaders, readers um, with more information, information that they need, but also to put spotlight on yes. good things that are happening um, because there are lots of great things that are happening. There are challenges, but right. there are incredible things that are happening in healthcare, and I have a pretty unique position in this role uh, to to get to see it, to experience it from from every segment of the, the sector. So um, I'm very very fortunate to yes. to be in this position. So yeah. thank you for the opportunity, and uh, I look forward to staying in touch and and, yeah. and in, uh, following. Uh, you and and all of the great things that you're doing to uh, to help others. Well, thank you very much. And again, thanks for joining us on our Ahead of the Curve series. And Juan Lopez, you are definitely making a difference in the world, and we appreciate you sharing your story with us today. Thank you so much. Take care. All right. Bye bye. Okay. So that, okay. Thank you How so much. It? I'm so glad we were able to, <laughs> to get this going. So thank you again for your generosity of time and, and your patience and perseverance. <laughs> was, it, was, it, was it what you needed? Yes, perfect. Perfect. Okay. So we will okay. uh, be fast at work this week, uh, just editing. We put a nice little intro on. Um, again, if you could send me some type of headshot, because we'll put that on our website. And then we'll give you the, the link um, that you can put this anywhere you want. Um, so that you can share it with others, etc. Okay, thank you so much. And again, it's an honor. Thank you so much. Fawn, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Have a great day okay. and a great rest of the week. Thanks, Maureen. All righty. Bye-bye.